Welcome everyone. We see some folks starting to trickle into the webinar. We're so excited. This is our last webinar of our winter 2022 Moving Forward Network webinar series. Um, we're so thankful that you all were able to join us today and apologies and gratitude that we weren't able to hold our original date last week. As you all can imagine, and I'm sure you all are feeling it too, the sort of extra heaviness of the current level of the pandemic and just sort of the state of this particular 2022 winter is real cute and fun. Uh, really forcing many of us to really think about, can I do this right now? And what do I need in order to really do it the way that I want to do it? So thankfully our quality control at MFN um, and your patience and grace has allowed us to move this final webinar um, one week later. And we're so glad and excited and grateful that you are able to be here and join us. Um, as per the usual, please let us know in the chat right now, who are you? Who's here? What organization are you with? Uh, what geographic location are you in right now? What's the weather like there? So just say hello briefly in the chat. Let us know who's here. And also along the way in our presentation today in the webinar, um, Put all of your questions either directly in the chat, or you might notice that on the platform for Zoom, there's a QA and a uh, section and area. Please put your questions there. If we can answer them along the way, we will. Um, if you have a question sort of in the moment, please put that in the chat. We can offer that up to our amazing panelists and presenters today. So um, put those questions in the Q&A, put them in the chat. Let us know right now just who's here. And we're gonna get started in just a few seconds, waiting for a few more folks to trickle in. Um, I see we've got some introductions down here in the chat. Uh, ben from Groundwork Northeast, um, Revitalization Group, Kansas City, Kansas, getting ready for a winter storm. Yes, yes, if it hasn't already come to you, um, it's, it's coming to you as our presenters are joining us from New York. I'm sure they can tell us all about the winter and the snow. Uh, and the snaps happening right now. So um, again, as we're about to get started, please don't forget, let us know who you are in the chat, um, your name, organization, where you're joining us from. This is an opportunity for us to say hello to folks that maybe we've known um, or introduce ourselves to new folks. So we also have uh, someone from Florida, Food Network and the Greater Frenchtown Revitalization Council. Nice to see you all here. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. One last pitch, put any questions here um, in the chat and also use the Q&A feature. If we have time uh, towards the end in our last 15 minutes um, for our Q&A moment, we can also just raise your hand and I can unmute you if you wanna just speak your question or your comments as well. This webinar will be recorded. It'll be then featured on the MFN YouTube channel and maybe also um, our other organizations that are joining us today, Push Buffalo and Cooperation Buffalo. And then finally, you will get a follow-up email from us letting you have access for a week to this recorded webinar. So if you wanna share it with other folks, um, and also if you know anyone who registered and was going to join us today, but isn't able to, they will have access to the recording as well. So again, thank you all for joining. I'm going to step out of the way. My name is Felicia Perez. It's been such an honor to work with MFN and help produce these webinars. And so now on to our final panelists. It is such a great honor and I'm so excited to introduce to you all uh, Don Wells Clyburn from uh, Push Buffalo, People United for Sustainable Housing, and also Andrew Del Monte from Cooperation Buffalo. So off to you all. And uh, again, put those questions and comments in the chat in the Q&A feature. Thank you so much, Felicia. Um, again, my name is Don Wells Clyburn. I'm the Deputy Director of Administration for uh, Push Buffalo, People United for Sustainable Housing. Um, we're a 15-year-old uh, organization, and I've been with the organization for almost nine years now. Um, and I, I oversee the day-to-day -day business operations uh, for the organization. Um, so, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Push Buffalo. Of course, you know, we are a, an organization that really focuses on um, building community power. And so it's very interesting that uh, the question um, in our slide is, you know, 
how do we build community power? Um, sorry, I don't know why our why my mic is so hard to hear. Can you hear me better now? Maybe just speak up a little bit more, or, or if you want, Don, you see where your mic is. If it's not too much trouble, just kind of hold it closer. There we go. Is that better? Oh, that's much louder, but it's it's on the better point. Yes. Okay. Good. 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 So yes, we um, we really believe firmly in community power building. Everything that we do, from our organizing team to our affordable housing units, start with community based solutions. Um, and what we what we found the the what, uh, so to speak. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Felicia? Um, the what, uh, in, in the spring of 2020, PUSH responded to our community, um, community outcries uh, for support um, by quickly turning our gymnasium into a headquarters for a mutual aid hub where we were able to distribute food um, and resources, uh, cleaning supplies and things like that. Um, and we believe we can use um, uh, opportunities like this to help people find the solutions to their own problems with support. And so, you know, with that, we say the power is in the hands of the people when they have agency and when it's done with dignity, um, that's when we really feel that, you know, we can make an impact. Um, so we looked at this opportunity. Um, we looked at this crisis as an opportunity to share resources and to get really creative with how we were going to respond uh, to the need. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the need uh, basically came from different, you know, from different uh, areas all over, you know, the city, um, but primarily in our uh, service area on the west side of Buffalo, we had people calling in uh, for food. Um, and most of this, you know, came in because people were becoming sick, they were caregiving, they were um, fearful of working, um, you know, and especially in unsafe working conditions or uncertain working conditions because of the newness of the pandemic. And they were also in fear of being evicted. Um, I'm sure this was not, you know, this was not just the impact uh, locally, this was um, nationwide. Um, and we're still dealing with it to some degree. Um, so we were able to provide or at least respond to the need for food, cleaning supplies, masks, um, uh, to assist with transporting um, some of those things to folks uh, directly um, because sometimes it was um, difficult for folks to come to the site. So we arranged for uh, transportation, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and the, the, one of the most um, impactful things that we did besides provide food uh, to the community was the landlord intervention and rent support. Um, so we were able to successfully um, welcome over 3,500 folks to our mutual aid hub. Um, either directly or by providing that support mobily. And we um, covered about $90,000 in grocery and household supplies uh, to, you know, directly to individuals um, for that support. We also, um, I mentioned the landlord intervention and rent support. We provided $58,000 in direct, direct support uh, to individuals and families for rent and utilities. And this also included direct payments to landlords um, after you know, extensive negotiations um, to get rent um, abated. Um, and we also were able to forgive uh, rent for the month of April and May of 2020 for PUSH tenants. So PUSH has um, both commercial and residential tenants, our commercial uh, tenants, our small uh, BIPOC businesses, um, and they were suffering with, you know, the effects of the uh, pandemic as well. And we also have um, a senior, a building that has senior residents, um, and we were able to provide that support as well. We um, were able to 
support local cooperatives and small businesses in $26,000 in financial support. So that was outside of the direct rent payments um, to those commercial businesses. And Andrew, I'm sure, will talk a little bit more about that, um, what that support looked like in terms of the cooperatives. Um, we didn't just look at um, providing support to individuals. We really took a look around um, you know, at our landscape and said, who else is doing this work and who needs support? And how can we get um, services and, and resources to the communities faster? So we partnered, we, we reached out to our partners and allies to find out what they were doing and what supports they needed. And um, this came in, you know, multiple, multiple ways. Um, we provided $46,500 to um, other grassroots, small and grassroots organizations, um, Justice, Justice for Migrant Families, the Coalition for Economic Justice, um, of course, Cooperation Buffalo, Mutual Aid Fund, and uh, Grassroots Garden, um, local um, uh, landscaping and uh, gardening effort. Next slide, please. So the response, um, we were able to fundraise. Um, that was obviously a, a, a big portion of this, um, about $250,000. And of that, uh, you know, significant part of it went to rent, to the rent support and the direct uh, financial support. Um, we also were able to provide supplies and how we, you know, went about doing this was we were open uh, three days a week initially from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, the hub was um, uh, generated um, with staffing, uh, push staff and volunteers, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, but we partnered with, um, you know, U.S. Foods and other folks in the area who were contributing food um, as they were getting assistance. I think that's a really... Um, that was really the most, um, um, I think, soul-stirring point. Like people were getting food and they were getting support. And as they were feeling like they were in a position, they would come back and they would volunteer to help other folks out. So that was really important. And we were also able to distribute uh, vital information that otherwise folks would not have had access to. So we would put flyers in the grocery bags, um, for voters registration, about upcoming campaigns, um, you know, a lot of information about what was going on with the pandemic and how to navigate um, with the landlords, who to contact if folks were having issues. And I think that was really impactful. We were able to keep the mutual aid hub open from April 2020 to August 2020. Um, it was very, um, a very fast moving train um, from the moment that the pandemic hit. We knew that we wanted to do this. We knew that we wanted to respond. I think if, you know, when I look back and I think about, okay, the question is always asked, how, you know, how were we able to do this? How were we able to pivot quickly? And, you know, without, you know, uh, mention it, it was a lot of blood, sweat and tears, but we were able to do it and and respond in a in a in a in a major way. Next slide, please. So one of uh, you know obviously the major components of staffing the hub was the conversion. So our gymnasium uh, that formerly ha held youth programming, basketball, you know senior um, uh, you know programming, we quickly made the decision to convert it over and we had to find um, all of the resources, staffing, um, volunteers, um, the infrastructure, how are we gonna you know, support this effort for, I think initially we thought we were only gonna do it for two months and you know, it ended up being <laughs> several months. And then, you know, I'd mentioned before the partnerships and the allies that we had. So how can we best utilize the networks that are already in place without recreating uh, the wheel and really be, you know, really streamline um, delivery to everyone and, you know, obviously fundraising. 
So with the staffing, um, we, we really took the approach that all hands on deck um, as soon as possible. Um, so we were already in, in the process of um, securing uh, remote work for everyone. So that meant like just for the regular day to day outside of the pandemic and the mutual aid hub, we needed to provide laptops. We needed to make sure that the technology um, was sufficient um, and if you know that folks had internet access to be able to support this effort. But one of the major pieces was um, being able to field calls from people who needed very specific uh, types of help, especially with the rent, um, the rent support. So we have a team uh, called Push Green, um, and Push Green was very instrumental to the um, uh, early days and, and really throughout the entire um, hub infrastructure to receive phone calls. So Push Green typically would handle weatherization and was responsible for the state's energy and research development programs that we um, that we work with. Um, but since we were in the pandemic, they didn't have any work. And so we thought, oh my goodness, what do we need to do? Oh, how do we respond? We can take this team that really has like no work to do and keep them working and also be able to respond to the call. So. Thankfully, we had already done some, some significant technology upgrades with our phone systems that allowed us to forward calls to the group for a specific period of time to take those calls in. And it was their responsibility to um, you know, receive those calls and dispatch you know, to whoever, you know, whoever needed to go to. So that was really, um, I feel, a really important uh, lesson learned, best practice. Um, we also, um, you know, we had volunteers and we had to have folks who could staff the volunteer, manage the volunteers and let them know how to get in the building, how to get out, what the lay of the land was. And so we had one designated staff person to, um, on rotation uh, to manage, um, you know, volunteers coming into the space to help us pack, to unload um the service truck when it would deliver food to the gym and to navigate traffic as that stuff happened. Um, and basically, you know, the delivery, the packing, the coordination um, was really significant to um, being able to have these packages ready for the um, folks who would deliver the food. So it, it was on a, a very tight timeline. So for example, on Monday, if we know we had to distribute food, then this meant on Thursday, the week prior, we would have to have those volunteers there packing up and everything ready to go and put into the refrigerated truck for pickup um, from the, from the uh, couriers. And so overall, we had about 70 uh, volunteers um, who came. And the picture that you see right here is one of uh, the community members who is who had received food and who was coming back to help um, pack. Um, so that's, you know, that was really um, exciting um, to do that. And, you know, we, we got a lot accomplished, but one of the, not even but, and, <laughs> um, the one thing that folks don't really necessarily see or know about that I think is important to other folks who are thinking about implementing this or, you know, trying to improve what they're doing is looking at the system support, the infrastructure that, you know, that you currently have and how to improve that or make it a little bit more firm so that you can accommodate. So outside of staffing and pivoting to that work, um, we, we decided that we were going to make decisions about how to disperse funds in a committee format. And so we intentionally um, recruited um, rank and file staff, all kinds of staff throughout the entire organization to, um, no matter what their function was, to be a part of this decision-making uh, body that would disperse um, the terms and also negotiate the terms between a landlord and tenant. We had a lot of landlords that were just like, I don't know what you're talking about. I need all of my rent right now, um, you know, or they have to go. And that was uh, a lot of a lot of legwork, a lot of hours spent to negotiate those contracts. 
Um, and to develop the contract uh, template itself, you know, we had to, you know, make sure that it was airtight um, from a legal standpoint and uh, get those things out. Um, the information flow, we had to develop a tracking system for incoming donations um, that would report directly out only on this effort, not our um, programmatic efforts. Um, and then we, it, it kind of propelled us to really use um, uh, the Salesforce system that had been newly implemented the year before as the case management um, process for um, handling all of the requests for support. Um, the fund, fund distribution process, I wanted to touch really quickly on that part of the infrastructure. We um, really uh, struggled in the, in the early days to figure out how to get payment to folks really quickly. And we experimented a lot because with our offices being closed, we were not processing hard checks anymore. We were processing payments for vendors via ACH and electronic check. And what we learned was that in order to, excuse me, in order to get the um, payments out very quickly, we had to process by PayPal, Venmo, um, and Deluxe. So we had to get really creative with how to disperse that. Excuse me one second, hold on. As you can see, Don is already getting a phone call about this mutual aid right now. No, uh, Don, go ahead. And, <laughs> Don, go ahead. Keep Thank going. you for your patience. Um, yeah, so I turned my cell phone off, but then we have the hard line here um, coming in. So, um, yeah, I think that was really important to mention how we were able to do that because it was not like a, a cookie cutter approach at all. It was literally, oh my goodness, let me download these apps onto my phone and get payments out to folks. Or we have an electronic check that we can print off here because folks didn't know how to process it. And then we're actually going out from our homes to other folks' homes um, to deliver them, you know. so. That was, um, you know, a lot. Um, and then, you know, moving on, partnerships. I'd mentioned that earlier. We, we used um, a, a, a really um, allyship uh, connection to figure out who could help us uh, do this work. And we, you know, received word from Queen City Couriers, who we, had, we already had a really good relationship with. Um, and they stepped up and they said, we'll do it, we'll, we'll deliver them. So they, you know, had their bikes, Queen City Couriers is a, you know, a, a courier service that is mostly bike, people on bikes. And they came in and saved the day, really. Um, and United, United Foods, uh, U.S. Foods, uh, was the um, vendor that stepped up and said, we will do this. We will work with you all. We will give you a discount. We'll figure out, we'll do whatever we have to do. And we literally had like a, a semi, <laughs> a semi truck in our parking lot, um, you know, five, six days out the week to um, deliver this food. And uh, the mutual aid network of Buffalo. So a lot of calls and inquiries came in through mutual aid network and we also learned a lot from that network of how to really uh, respond to the needs um, and funders and donors so a lot of times we you know we will get questions well how were you able to you know shell out this type of money and and forgive rent and you know process you know um uh you know these invoices for food that was coming in, was it all through donors, individual donors? Well, we had $60,000 from about 300, 300 push donors. Um, however, um, the most significant funding came from PUSH's existing funding network where we had funders that would, you know, we would either reach out to them directly or they would reach out to us and say, hey, what can we do to help? We heard that you're doing this. And they would release the re restriction or provide additional funds to us for mutual aid relief. And so that allowed us to really, you know, get the funds out there to pass through to other organizations and to, um, and to make this, this uh, effort happen. 
I think that's the next slide. Yep. Okay. I think I this is where I, I pass it on to Andrew or back to you, Felicia. I don't know if we have any um, questions that you want me to take. No questions so far. So we'll we'll hold off until until Andrew is done, and then we'll get all our questions and comments in, unless folks put them in along the way. So go ahead, Andrew. Awesome. Thank you, Don. I. I was so inspired at the time being so close to the push mutual aid hub and getting to like relive it through this. <laughs> this webinar is, is also um, really inspiring and, and energizing for me too. It was a really like all hands on deck. We're doing this for our neighbors and for each other kind of moment. It was very, it, you know, as, as horrendous as that period was in, in early 2020, it was also a really like galvanizing and solidifying experience at the same time. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Andrew, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, I'm the executive director of a small organization called Cooperation Buffalo. Um, we started as an unincorporated project back in 2016, um, and a few years into that um, experiment, uh, we uh, joined forces with PUSH um, to be fiscally sponsored by PUSH for three years from 2019 through 2021, and have only recently grown enough wings to be able to fly out of the nest and, and be on our own now. So um, we're, we're a little bit more independent, but during the, the, the heat of the pandemic that we're talking a little bit about today, we were under the wing of PUSH and, and also very entwined with um, PUSH's mutual aid efforts while also trying to support the the burgeoning cooperative business community in Buffalo that we were supporting. Um, so you'll see our, our mission statement here. We um, are a nonprofit uh, project that focuses on both community organizing and um, business development as a means to lift workers up into ownership positions. So we're trying to get people to start or convert existing businesses to the worker cooperative model where all of the employees co-own the business together own an asset for some people it's their only opportunity to do so and build wealth and and have financial security through being owners of the place where they work and, and being able to control their workplace rather than um, uh, being in the rather precarious position that many workers are in these days um, next slide please we do this through a few different ways so uh, we're trainers and educators and organizers um, we do a lot of work locally in buffalo um, uh, just talking about what cooperative economics is, getting people to start thinking in this way. This is something that your traditional economic development and, and small business development resources don't mention as an option. So we have to do a lot of <laughs> unlearning and relearning with folks that this is a way that, that, that we can be in an economy and in community with each other. Um, we support the incubation of specific worker co-ops that align with our mission. Um, and then we offer technical assistance to other co-ops which don't necessarily align fully with our values and principles, but we have a mission more broadly to grow um, the co-op sector here in Buffalo. We probably have, oh, about a dozen cooperative businesses in total, and only three or four of those are worker-owned cooperatives, which is the, the subsection of co-ops that we're really focused on. Um, so we're doing a lot of work just to grow that ecosystem and to find projects that are ready to be incubated. And, and our main focus is is folks who have been traditionally excluded from the mainstream economy um, and through all of the sort of cross sections of oppression that that touches. Um, we also notably participate in a loan fund, um, a national loan fund that circulates capital to cooperatives in a non-extractive way and is governed appropriately as a cooperative itself. This national loan fund is called Seed Commons. Um, and, and long term for us, we're also thinking about ways that we can replicate the national loan fund model by building a local community controlled loan fund. But at our scale and size right now, it makes much more sense to be tied to um, a national infrastructure for, for the financing capital that our cooperatives might need. Co-ops generally are less able to access traditional financing through commercial banks or even through other CDFIs because of things like personal guarantee requirements um, and, and you know credit score and collateral mixes that just don't work for the folks that we work with. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do, but I'm obviously going to get us talking a little bit more about the, the mutual aid work um, that we did in 2020 and 2021. Um, so I'm gonna step back for a little bit. I imagine that everyone on the call knows a certain amount about mutual aid. That's why you're here, you're interested in it. I just wanna share some of these bullets more um, as a way to say like, this is some of the, the values and principles that we brought into how we thought about mutual aid in our project specifically. Um, so really fundamentally, this this notion that mutual aid is solidarity, not charity, which 
obviously becomes a very um, interesting conundrum when we as nonprofits who engage a little bit more in the traditional role, traditional charitable models have to craft programs that can meet more of the solidarity model than the traditional foundation grant supporting charitable causes model that we get shoehorned into off. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but that was a really fundamental way that we were thinking about this. Um, another way that we framed this to the community when we were working with them was capitalism is the crisis, right? We certainly had um, the immediate crisis of, of COVID-19. We've had past immediate crises just in this last decade of financial ups and downs and things like that. But at the root of this is mutual aid is here because there are communities whose needs are not met by the overarching system, by capitalism, right? And mutual aid is a great way to point out and do something about particular flaws in that system and address needs that are not being met. Um, mutual aid is often a crisis response. Um, some folks in some communities have been in crisis for hundreds of years. And so mutual aid is an ongoing practice, not something that only crops up just when, when a crisis happens. Crisis is, is, is a lived reality for a lot of folks day in and day out. So that's, that's part of this. Um, and then lastly, we also think about mutual aid as against austerity and this concept of disaster capitalism, which is where you'll see um, governments and, and states and large corporations taking advantage of a major disaster to adopt economic policies that the population would generally be less likely to be all about, but, but in a disaster, we'll take what we can get, right? And so mutual aid is a way to say, we're not going to take whatever you're going to try to throw at us top down in this model. We're going to practice ways that, that we know we can share and distribute resources equitably. So that those were some of our sort of tenets in designing what we did. Um, next slide, please. So what isn't mutual aid? Here's one example. I'm very happy that Governor Cuomo's face is generally blurred out in this picture, but, but this was something that popped up around the same time. Um, you know, uh, mutual aid between states is, is certainly not what, what we have in mind. And obviously there's no copyright on this term, right? So you're gonna see it used in a lot of other different ways. But this is more of an example of just how government should be working and not really an example of what we're talking about. And there's certainly other, um, examples of, of what folks call mutual aid that doesn't really fit this solidarity, not charity, um, and, and capitalism is the crisis mindset that, that we're bringing to it. Next slide, please. So I want to take a minute, hopefully you all are familiar with many, if not all of these, but just to, to highlight some inspirational mutual aid programs um, historically that I think also show the breadth and applicability of this model at the COVID-19 as a pandemic was, was certainly a really obvious moment when, when this became necessary, but there's tons of other um, elements of the mainstream economic system that have gaps that require a filling. And, and here's some ways that folks have done this. So obviously, and, and pretty famously, the Black Panthers um, ran a school lunch program because children in Black communities were not receiving the food aid that they needed. Uh, similarly, food not bombs arose um, out of a, a lack of food aid in communities all across the globe. Um, and, and that also at the same time is drawing attention to over militarization, which is where those resources are going instead of just feeding people, right? Um, no mas muertes and no more deaths um, is another example um, of uh, folks providing water and survival supplies to folks at the southern U.S. border. Um, and the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR, um, arose following the Stonewall Rebellion um, in New York City to offer housing and aid to transgender and queer folks um, during those uprisings and that unrest. Um, also, solidarity support during direct actions is another example of where mutual aid comes up a lot. Uh, one example I like to lift up is lesbian and gays support the minors. Um, which was a group of LGBTQ activists from London who came together in the mid 80s to support the strike of the National Union of Mine Workers in Northern UK um, after Margaret Thatcher blocked the union from receiving other forms of aid. Uh, the great way where we see this intersectionality of, of movements and oppressions, right? Um, and then obviously disaster responses, right? So mutual aid efforts that, that arose during the recent hurricanes that we've had um, the penny auctions during the Great Depression era when farmers would ensure that um, their fellow farmers could buy back their farms for a penny um, was a form of mutual aid. And obviously, all of the mutual aid efforts that sprung up during the COVID-19 pandemic, we're talking about just a couple examples in Buffalo, but, but almost every major city in the U.S. Um, saw some grassroots movement where folks were meeting um, their community members' needs um, in the past couple of years, which has been very inspiring. Next slide, please. Um, 
a little bit more about how cooperation buffaloes work intersects with the concept of mutual aid. Um, and it's really centering around this, this notion of solidarity, right? So worker cooperatives are one example, as you'll see in this big wheel diagram on the screen here, uh, of an aspect of, of something that is sometimes referred to as the solidarity economy. Um, the folks at Highlander um, describe it as an alternative framework for economic development and systemic transformation grounded in principles of social solidarity, cooperation, equity, pluralism, sustainability, and participatory democracy. That's a lot of terminology. The, the basis is it's people meeting each other's needs in an equitable way um, with, without top-down hierarchy to it, right? And, and worker co-ops, what, what our um, small organization is tasked with trying to promote and encourage and grow um, here in Buffalo, New York, it is an economic model of how we can arrange business organizations to, to meet this solidarity economy um, mindset. And obviously there's all sorts of other solidarity economy um, uh, elements that, that weave a tapestry that creates potentially a better way of us organizing our home economy um, management of home, right? So we have things like credit unions, the concept of the commons and collective ownership of land. Um, employee stock ownership is another model of, of employee ownership of businesses. Um, collectives, barter systems, and obviously mutual aid systems and consumer co-ops and housing co-ops and, and things like this. So, so um, mutual aid efforts are sometimes a more temporary and, and transitory sort of model of, of solidarity economy in action. And, and part of what we wanted to really convey to folks um, during the pandemic was how there are ways to make this type of um, action that we're doing a little bit more permanent. Have you thought about organizing your mutual aid collective into a worker cooperative that supplies food in your community more permanently? Have you thought about the, the um, mutual aid efforts to um, alleviate folks housing uh, and rent burdens and to forming housing cooperatives or real estate cooperatives where the community can permanently own its housing in the future. And so there's some direct ties to what we were trying to do to the crisis at hand, which, which made it really powerful. Um, next slide, please. Obviously what folks needed in the moment, um, very often in, in the small business world and the cooperative world was just money to keep the business going and to keep the lights on, right? So um, uh, we took the approach, again, sort of weaving this tapestry with the other mutual aid efforts that Push Buffalo was doing with its mutual aid hub, meeting individuals' needs to try to meet the needs of the um, independent small businesses and, and obviously cooperative businesses that were already in our community, in our ecosystem, that we wanted to make sure we were preserving and not losing in this moment of instability. So um, we took about $30,000 of our operating budget for Cooperation Buffalo in 2020, which sounds like a small amount, but we were also a staff of two at the time. So that was actually a really significant <laughs> reprioritization and using our budget as a moral document in that moment to say like, where does this money really need to go in this time? Um, and then we also, through Push's help and through the help of, of others in our, our networks, were able to, to add on some additional funding from philanthropy. Again, th these were folks like Dawn mentioned who were really interested in just deploying funds for the purposes of meeting mutual aid needs. So these, this money didn't come with a lot of strings attached, whereas sometimes philanthropic money can come with a lot of strings attached. And so this was helping us to still achieve that solidarity, not charity model, because we didn't have to turn around a means test in, in great detail how we were handing this money out to folks that needed it. So over, over about a year and a half, we gave away a little over $70,000 in what we called micro grants. So these are really small amounts. It was businesses letting us know, hey, we need $300 to pay the rest of our rent bill this month, or we had to furlough our employees, but we still need some money to buy inventory for next month. Can we have a couple hundred bucks and, and, and that sort of thing. So we gave this out to the existing co-ops in our um, small cooperative ecosystem in Buffalo. Um, we, we also handed it out to workers or members of those co-ops who maybe did need some a, a personal um, uh, financial resources to get through to buy some groceries, things like that. And then a lot of our funds also went to other uh, primarily Black, Indigenous, and other people of color owned small businesses in our immediate place-based area of the west side of Buffalo, where, where we and PUSH are located, and, and more broadly across the city of Buffalo. Um, and it was 75 different individuals and businesses. So you can see the size of these grants were generally pretty small, but it was it was enough to really get people stabilized. And that was that was the goal. Our application process was really simple. It was like five questions. We didn't means test any of this that was really in line with our values. So applic applicants were just asked, what do you need? 
Um, and then also we ask them to reflect on their access to other funds and, and their access to maybe other forms of privilege. And we also let them know what the total pot was and the fact that we're trying to get this out to as many people as possible. So we had a very um, sort of like equitable conversation with folks about the kind of funding we had and could offer. Um, and it led to some really great conversations, I think, with some of these small business owners that we, we work with as well. I think I've just just got one final slide to, to pan back out a little bit and show um, some other examples across the worker cooperative um, and cooperative um, community across the nation um, to show that this wasn't just something that Cooperation Buffalo did because it seemed to fit our values, but also these other solidarity economy um, uh, institutions were thinking similarly. So our national uh, cooperative lender that I mentioned that we're members of called Seed Commons also developed a worker response fund, did something really similarly to what we did, but on a national level. And this was really helpful because the, the different peer member organizations that make up Seed Commons across the US, some have been around longer, some have, are just starting out, some have the resources that Cooperation Buffalo does, some have like half a staff person or, or a fully volunteer crew at this point. So the ability to to make sure that Seed Commons was providing this level of support to co-ops across our network, regardless of what was, what infrastructure was on the ground was really powerful. Um, and then these two examples on the left and right are two um, food businesses that are worker owned cooperatives. Um, one in Baltimore there, um, you'll see the Baltimore Sun uh, newspaper clipping, and then also Woke Foods in New York City, um, who were able to, to find some um, funding and, and support for them to be able to make uh, dinners and meals for people to just give out. And so at, at the time of this uh, Instagram post from Woke Foods, they had given out a thousand uh, meals, I think over um, something like 10 weeks or something like that. And they continued onward after that. And it was a great, great thing to see worker cooperatives finding ways to still provide work for their workers, right? That the people that make up these businesses, we can still provide meals, even if our restaurant is closed or our food business can't, you know, service the, the, usual clientele that we service. And, and there's certainly a need out there. And the one thing that we produce is food. So let's make sure that that's getting in the hands of those that need it. But I highlight these as an example of how these solidarity economy functions and, and the notion of mutual aid can exist across nonprofits, like what Don and I have been highlighting that, that we were able to do at our organizations, but also across the for-profit world and, and um, these other uh, community-based institutions that keep us thriving. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking there and we can shift to questions. Okay, before we get to questions, just really wanna say thank you to the two of you and um, please share that gratitude and that thanks back with the rest of the team, right? Y'all are, are here as leaders and, and spokespeople to really share the information so graciously and please extend our, our gratitude to everyone else who, who played such an instrumental role in this work. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We have some really great and powerful questions that are currently in the Q&A. Um, also, please put anything that you want in the chat as well. Um, I'm going to go through the questions in the Q&A and whoever wants to answer them, let's go ahead and do that. So we have a question that says, one struggle we see in our mutual aid work is that it's difficult for an under-resourced community to pitch in much to help their neighbors. Have you all run into that? And do you have any thoughts about how to address it, right? Like if, if you don't have the funding part or you don't have the staffing part, like what can you do to help? And what experience did you all have in, in having those orgs feel that that reciprocity was equal or equitable in some sort of way as well? I'll, I'll take a stab at it and Andrew, of course, you know, first Don, time. do you mind bringing, oh, bringing up the I mic? I keep forgetting about this mic. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, that's better. All right. Thank you. I'll take a stab at it. And of course, Andrew, chime in. Um, I think what was, un it was a little unique in this moment that everyone was in crisis mode and wanted to help, uh, you know, their neighbors um, in this uh, city in particular, we are called the city of good neighbors. So I think um, living into that was like a priority of this community. And we had already done a lot of base building to engage the community in a way that um, that ownership um, um, and, and sense of, of pride was already, already embedded um, into uh, just the way, the vibe of the community. I think that um, it would definitely be a challenge for a smaller organization that is under resourced to pull off the effort that we did um, because you know it's it's just a, a, an unfortunate consequence 
of the not-for-profit funding structure that, you know, the, the, the funds, the smaller organizations that get, that don't have that recognition don't necessarily get the funding. And so I think partnerships is a key, key component, engaging the community. And, you know, once again, I started out by saying meeting the community where they are. If the community members feel empowered, meaning like they're already involved or they feel that there's a need, then it would be much easier for them to engage and see what can be done to improve the conditions of their entire area because they're looking at it not just from an I, they, they could look at it from a we. So that's, that's what I would say. Andrew, do you have any comments on, on that to add to that? I think that's great. I mean, it, it, it certainly highlights the, the benefits of, of the infrastructure that we had in place, right? Like PUSH is a very well-known and, and well-established community-based organization that has relationships to donors and relationships to philanthropy who wanted to, to share funds in this way for this purpose. And I think if mutual aid efforts or smaller organizations are finding themselves with a not enough resources to pull this off. It really is a signal like, where is that partnership? Like Dawn was saying, with someone who does have those relationships or with folks who have resources that just need to be shared. And this is a moment to ask them to do so. I think about the all of the calls for folks to, to share their surplus checks, right? If you don't need the $1,200 that the government has given you, these are the kinds of places it should be going to because it's all of that money is gonna go directly to your community member who needs it, right? It's not gonna be, siphoned off for administrative fees or for other things like this in, in the true mutual aid spirit. And, and the, we also had a, a very um, small scale uh, mutual aid effort that was very decentralized called Buffalo Mutual Aid Network um, that, that uh, Dawn and, and Push Buffalo, I think got some funds to as well. And we definitely partnered with in this process. And they certainly raised a lot of funds through, through asking folks on social media to share their checks if they didn't need it. Okay, so hoping that that is is starting that that answer and getting some things percolating for folks to consider even more right like meeting where people are at and definitely at the same time it's always unclear what we think we have to contribute and and sometimes how little we we think that it could actually be of help right in terms of i can pack some bags i have some time um i have multiple people in my household right now who all have some time or as you were saying you know that example with the surplus checks but even things of i speak multiple languages or i have extra paper like whatever it is that you have right and really sort of coming up with that list of what are the needs first and then it's quite very you know quite possible that what is of the need people have we just really have to come up with that needs list first um i'm going to pivot to another question that we have here, which is first uh, an appreciation. Thank you for sharing the presentations. And then the questions are, can you share about the potential long term of mutual aid practice, right? Like y'all were talking about something that happened at the sort of um, key lockdown moment of the pandemic. And now that we are all in this moment of going from pandemic to endemic, how do we go from pandemic to endemic living with COVID? How do we also live with capitalism knowing that it's not working, right? Like how do we live in multiple crises, but have that sort of you know, long-term mutual aid practice? The question also includes, does it become part of the organizational structure? Is it such a long-term need that now it's embedded in the work that y'all are doing? Or does it move into its own organization or own cooperative? And y'all just mentioned some other sort of, you know, groupings and, and alliances. Did they keep going? Are they still, you know, organizing around this work? So what's the long-term practice? Um, does it become part of the org structure? Is it its own org or cooperative? Um, I think in, in, in some ways, this organization has already, already um, had like a, a, a embedded philosophy of mutual aid, even though, even before we had the words to describe what it was, right? And yes, in this moment, it was a very short term emergency response to the need. But I think overall, and, and long term, I think organizations and organizations like ours, um, regardless of the size, should be thinking about how to incorporate um, some sort of emergency response um, component into their budget plans, and it doesn't necessarily have to be all encompassing. I think the the beauty of what we saw was that this wasn't push push buffaloes per se. This was the work of the community. This was the work of 
our allies. This was, you know, having those relationships with people, you know, like if it wasn't for the relationship with Kate, for example, with U.S. foods, we would not have even known how to get that food on a large scale, right? Um, if it wasn't for the relationship that Harper had with um, uh, Queen City, uh, Harper is our uh, former uh, deputy director of uh, uh, movement building to connect us to the right people in terms of delivery, we, maybe we didn't think about that. I think it, it comes down to being creative. It comes down to being resourceful and to also be as nimble as we can to move as we have, as we have the resources, as we have the needs and as opportunities become available. I do think that it's also the responsibility of, I'm just gonna put it out there, of philanthropy to change the way that they are releasing funds. I think what we saw in that moment with mutual aid and donors and, 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 and grant makers saying, hey, we can do this. The first thought that comes to mind is, why haven't we been doing this all along? Because we all know that it comes, it comes down to having the funds to be nimble, but it also comes down to the people power and have we been doing our part to um, support the community and doing its own work because it's not necessarily just us. Yes, I am a staff member of Push Buffalo, but I'm also a community member. I also believe in what we're doing and I know what the long-term goal is. And then the other thought that I'll, I'll leave us with is um, we do a lot of advocacy work and policies and legislation. I think it's also the charge, not just of the individual organizations, um, maybe that's on this call, but as a collective, how do we charge our government? The slide that Andrew uh, showed us of our governor and how they're using these catchphrase you know, terms is how do we charge them to live into what they think that they're saying and how do we hold them accountable? And I think that we need to continue to work together as a collective movement to change so that the burden, so to speak, for lack of a better word, is not just on these uh, smaller organizations or people who have limited resources or you have a very refined mission of how you need to um, move as an organization and really put it back on the, gov on the government, the governmental entities and holding them accountable as much as we can. And I also think that it's the responsibility of larger organizations or organizations of scale to share the resources as much as possible. So knowing that we cannot do everything on our own is actually not really a good practice if we say we believe in just transition, if we say we believe in movement to take take everything in on our own and try to do everything on our, you know, by ourselves. It's not that's not really um sustainable. So that's what I would say. Check out stop. I didn't want to get on my soapbox too much. Oh, no, that was a good box. That was a good box. Andrew and I were like, yes, yes, yes. I'm sure folks listening were as well. Andrew, do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, everything that Dawn said, absolutely yes. I think the, the only other piece of the answer for me is that, yes, there are so many opportunities to, to channel the energy and the organizing and the structures that are built through mutual aid efforts into more permanent economic institutions. And obviously the trick there is we're still under capitalism. So there's going to have to be a business model if it's going to become a cooperative business or something like that. So many of these things that really just rely on folks exchanging resources or, or the aspect of we need to be bringing in some outside resources through philanthropy or donors or something like that. Those those collective formations are still going to be unincorporated, maybe still going to be attached to nonprofit efforts. But if there is, you know, a community need that wasn't being met that the community can actually like exchange goods or, or money for, that there's a potential to just start a cooperative that meets our community's needs. And I think this certainly got a lot of people interested in that. Again, whenever we see a crisis, we always see an, an uptick in, in interest in solidarity economy models and cooperatives. and and us owning our own means of production, our own housing, our own things like that. And so I, some of the folks that were very involved in, in those mutual aid efforts in Buffalo in 2020 took our Cooperative Academy training course that fall, right? Because they, <laughs> they saw the connection and we, we talked to them about that connection. I also don't think it's a mistake that we had a, a really well-organized progressive mayoral campaign a year later too. Uh, I think the organizing efforts of folks coming together around community needs in 2020 during mutual aid 
meant that there were people coming together to talk more about these issues, even at the municipal level. I know Don mentioned the, the need to push against state and, and, and larger policies as well. But I, you know, this energy gets used in ways that then I think create more permanent institutions for us as well. Thank you both so much for really sharing in that moment the, the idea that if we're really trying to move away from a scarcity model to an abundance model, how do we do that? How do we create or cultivate abundance? And it's really hitting home with y'all's conversation and presentation today in the webinar that you create and cultivate abundance through that reciprocity and those allyships and that sort of partnership in the work before, after, and during an emergency or a crisis, right? And so our last question in the Q&A is, what kind of infrastructure needs to be there for setting up mutual aid? And I just wanna back up a second and really share, it was, it was sort of a, a, a light point, but Don mentioned, right, that a lot of this was held by Push Green. And Push Green was, you know, it's a weatherization program. They're going into people's homes and sort of checking to see are, are the windows letting in a draft? How's the air conditioning? How's the heater? What are all the ways in which we can help the home stay warm, stay cool, stay safe, and especially in terms of air quality during the pandemic? But that meant that Push Green and Push already had a reputation, already had sort of um, built the relationship of trust that we can go into your home, that we can help that we are providing the service that will make things actually better for your day-to-day -day life in your home. And that better home, better you, allows that political power and the rest of that work to also be able to happen. So for me, part of that answer to the infrastructure question is, we know that there are going to be more crises like this. We, we just know that there are. This wasn't the first one. This was many that led to this moment as well. And so now's the time to see that infrastructure because it's coming again. And so for me, the infrastructure that I really heard from the two of you was that reciprocity and that practice, that mutual aid is not an action where it's done and it happens and the goal is attained, but that the praxis is ongoing reciprocity, ongoing partnership, ongoing community sharing of whatever that wealth is that we might have in abundance. What else are key, very specific, infrastructure needs that y'all would give as advice and guidance for folks who are like, okay, I bought it. I'm in mutual aid. Let's do it. What do I need to do? It's mostly the soft feely things is the things that come to mind when I think about that, right? It's um, being um, courageous and bold and creative. I think that you know, yeah, I mentioned Push Green as a as a department that was, you know, they had a body of work. They would have not had work to do and thinking, constantly thinking, what do we do with what we have? So I think that coming together, not leaning, you know, so to speak on your own understanding, but also engaging again with the community. What do you need? Looking at where the problems are and figuring out the weak points of your organization and, and even strengthening strengthening them like one thing that i saw again was how do you know really simple things things that seem simple but are complex and nuanced and um solving them infrastructure how do you get a person payment how do you get your staff to be able to do the things that they need to do for a community member it seems simple we're not in a building but we can um come together and ask each other's each other question. We can have um, uh, brainstorming sessions with each other and figure these things out. And I think it's definitely um, um, specific to the organization's capacity and also to the creativity and and fluidity um, and, and, and risk tolerance, like, right? Like there was a degree of risk that was involved in making the shift that we did. You know, we had to talk to our stakeholders, we had to talk to our board, we had to talk to our staff, like, oh my God, I'm in a crisis and I don't know if I'm gonna have to care give for my family member. I, I will sit here and tell you and be honest, I really was not sure how we were gonna be able to do that, but having a degree of faith and having a degree of courage that we can do this, we can and should do this work because we have some resources. So that's that's what I what I have to give. <laughs> final final ideas, comments, feedback, Andrew. I, I think the most important infrastructure is the human infrastructure, like like you were saying, Felicia. Like it, 
organized communities are stronger together. And so if we're not doing the work to get to know each other and, and show up for each other, then all of this is a lot harder. And if there's enough humans involved, someone's gonna know how to make a spreadsheet to, to hand out the goods. Someone's gonna be able to figure out the fiscal and financial needs. Someone's gonna be able to figure out the legal or technical needs. So I, I'm less worried about the, the like, you know, the, the more traditional pieces of infrastructure. It's, it's about having enough people that are willing to show up for each other. And that's the work organizing each other that we can be doing crisis or not all the time. Yes. So if it's someone's birthday, someone's holiday, something happened that is very, you know, like hard and challenging in the family or an individual's life, show up, be there, acknowledge all the things from the little to the smalls. We need it all right now. And I just want a final tip. Don kept saying the word creativity, creativity. And lots of times we get lost in, I don't know where to start. Creativity, I can't make something out of nothing. Turns out creativity is taking something that you already have and using it for something different. We've all done that. That moment when you need a hammer and you use the stapler, that's creativity. So the moment when you have staff who are supposed to do weatherization, but they're not able to do that work and you pivot and you have them really lead or be a main central part to the, the sharing of all that mutual aid work, that's creativity. So that's what we mean when we say creativity. You have all that you need, as mentioned by everyone here. Thank you so much. We are here in this abundance creativity and in this moment of partnership. We appreciate you all being here for the webinar. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Andrew. See the thanks in the chat. Again, this recording will be shared with all of you who are attending today to share it out, to review things, to go back. And also, if you know folks who registered but weren't able to attend, that would will be available as well. We'll see this also on the MFN and maybe the uh, Cooperation Buffalo and the Push Buffalo uh, YouTube channels as well. Thank you all. Please stay safe. Take care of one another because we know that that's how we build power as well. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day and um, happy February. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Andrew. Bye-bye.